when we spoke a couple of days ago, I think what I was really excited about is, as we know, we're the media shop for challenger brands, and John has been a challenger his entire life. So there's tremendous kind of uh, symbiosis going on here. And with that, I'm just going to kind of ask John kind of four central questions, or kind of just riff and see where the conversation takes us. So John, first. I probably stole all your background, but I know you can add a little bit of color to it. So maybe talk a little bit about your background, how you got into this crazy business we all love and sometimes hate, and um, why you think you've always been a challenger and have been drawn to challenger brands. Well, thanks, John, and it's really fun to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm a co-founder of Zeta Global, and so uh, I have a pretty good insight in terms of uh, what um, Media Hub and Zeta Global are working on together, and, and of course we're very excited about that, that partnership. My uh, life in marketing really began after I graduated from uh, Wharton Business School with an MBA, and I was hired by Interpublic Group of Companies, and I was assigned after a training program to work on the Coca-Cola account. And uh, after a few years, I was recruited from uh, McCann, one of the Interpublic agencies, to Pepsi to become the first MBA to be hired by Pepsi. Uh, they put me out on a route truck for six months, uh, worked in bottling plants, reset shelves and in stores, really got uh, a hands-on feel of the, of the business. And then I ended up in uh, market research and product development and eventually was selected um, to become the vice president of marketing for Pepsi-Cola in the US, Pepsi-Cola company. Uh, they always called me a high wire act because they put me in jobs I was never fully, uh, you know, um, trained to do and qualified to do. But uh, when I got into the Pepsi job, John, uh, uh, Pepsi was outsold in the United States 10 to 1, 10 to 1 by Coca-Cola in 50% of the U.S. And the rest of the U.S. we did uh, better than that, even um were more successful than Coke in, in a few markets out in the Midwest, but it was a real challenge. We couldn't um, play by the same ground rules of the most valuable brand in the world, Coca-Cola. Uh, so as you describe uh, Media Hub uh, as a challenger brand uh, company, uh, that's exactly what my life has been about. It's been in uh, companies that uh, had their back up against the wall, had to come up with different strategies. And one of the strategies we came up with back in those early days when I was head of marketing at Apple uh, was the Pepsi challenge. And the Pepsi challenge was based on the idea that uh, there was a very, very slight uh, taste preference of Pepsi over Coke when the brands weren't identified. But as soon as you put the labels on, uh, most people chose Coca-Cola. Remember, we were outsold 10 to one in 50% of the country. But the beauty of the Pepsi challenge was that uh, because we and Coca-Cola had store door de delivery systems, uh, we could actually go with our franchise bottlers uh, into the stores, we could get involved with local uh, community events. So we ran these Pepsi challenge booths uh, in the community events, uh, often at uh, sports events and things of that sort. And we made commercials uh, this was the beginning of handheld uh, video. We made commercials that uh, people could say, gee, that looks just like the challenge booth I saw in real life. So it added authenticity to it. And the Pepsi challenge, uh, we took it market by market across the entire United States. So John, there obviously, you know, I was thinking, I mean, you know, we spoke a couple of days ago, but obviously there's new things to pop in my mind is, that was then copied by many, many brands after that. And what's the old saying, you know, um, you know, stealing a market or stealing an idea is the sincerest form of flattery or, or plagiarism is the sincerest form of uh, flattery. Did you know at that point what you had really started and when other brands copied that, how did Pepsi feel about that? Did they allow that? Did they try to stop that? Uh, it didn't bother us at all. Uh, when we started the Pepsi Challenge, uh, what we really wanted to do was, was to get under Coca-Cola's skin. Uh, and it worked because uh, they sued us. They said, this is unfair advertising. Um, it was based on fact that, that Pepsi did taste slightly better. And the whole campaign was uh, take the Pepsi Challenge. So you take a blind taste test uh, in real life and let your taste decide. And that was the reason why we never 
really cared that people tried to copy us because they didn't get it. Uh, what other people who um, tried to emulate the Pepsi challenge did was they said, uh, we are better, take the challenge, you know, see we're better. Nobody believes it when a manufacturer says, we are better. It, as we know even more today, uh, the customer is in control. The customer is the one who's gonna decide. And people are more influenced by what other customers have to say than they are when a manufacturer says that same message. So uh, it never really bothered us. And in fact, I can't remember any of the other companies that uh, emulated the Pepsi challenge, can you? I can't, I just know it was done. Um, so let's segue to Apple. I mean, one of the most fascinating companies for so many different reasons. Why don't you tell everybody a little bit about um, what it took to get you to Apple? Um, you know, there, uh, Steve Jobs can be a pretty persuasive human being, to say the least. Um, what thought went into that move? And then you kind of entered a company where if you thought you were taking on a giant in Coca-Cola, uh, going against Big Blue, which is a term that probably a lot of people uh, younger than a certain age probably don't even know, but boy, then you walked into even maybe even a, a bigger insurmountable situation. But so talk to us a little bit about uh, getting to Apple and then uh, the early part of your career at Apple. Well, I wasn't a logical choice to be selected as the CEO of, of Apple because I didn't come out of the high tech industry. And in fact, uh, uh, Steve Jobs wanted to be the CEO. He was 26 at the time. And the board said, no, you're not ready for it. Uh, but because you're the largest shareholder and the chairman of the board, um, you get to have the veto right. So they turned down roughly uh, over 20 different candidates because Steve didn't accept it. So <laughs> David Rockefeller, one of the early largest investors in, in Apple, said, well, why don't you try a different industry in a different part of the country? And so they knew I had, uh, well, at least Jerry Roach, who at the time was the leading uh, executive search fund, uh, uh, executive uh, search um, person uh, at Hydrogen Struggles said, well, I know this guy Scully. Uh, he knows a lot about um, uh, technology, but he's primarily a marketing guy. And so Steve and I spent five months getting to know each other. Uh, every weekend, I would either go to California or he'd come to New York and we would just spend time just hanging out. Um, at, at the end of that, uh, I think it was like uh, end of March, uh, 1983. I said, Steve, I've thought about it, but I'm not coming to Apple. I said, I'll be a, an advisor for free. Let's be you know, really good friends, but uh, I think I'll stay where I am. I was then the CEO of, of Pepsi. And Steve, uh, who was not only charismatic, but had this amazing uh, talent to uh, be able to say exactly the right thing at exactly the right moment, uh, in those days, he had jet black hair, very dark eyebrows, and, and his eyes were uh, very dark um, pupils. And he wore a, a mock turtleneck sweater that you would all recognize, and blue jeans and running shoes. And so he gets up about 18 inches from me. We're standing on the terrace of the apartment that he, he just bought at the San Remo Towers, which he eventually sold to, to uh, uh, bon, Bono. Um, he said, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to come with me and change the world? <laughs> so I just gulped and I didn't give him an answer, but a week later I was working at Apple. And that was, uh, most people don't realize that one of Steve's great talents was his ability to recruit people. Well, neither Steve nor I were engineers by training. Um, and he had this uh, outrageous idea at the time, they used to call it the Steve Jobs reality distortion effect, <laughs> on the distortion field. Uh, that he thought that the future of computing was going to be for human beings you know, who didn't know anything about technology, non-technical people. And the reason he wanted me to come join him was, and he wasn't allowed to be the CEO by the board, but he could be the, the chairman, so we were really partners. Uh, he, he said, you've got to teach me about marketing. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, uh, I believe the future of computing is going to be for non-technical people. I'm building this product that's under development called the Macintosh. And it's all about the user experience and the creative things you can do with it. Uh, but I don't know marketing. Uh, can you teach it to me? So um, I joined Pepsi, the, excuse me, I joined Apple. The, the first uh, focus 
for me, because Steve was building the Macintosh and I had no uh, background in building a personal computer. So my focus was turning around the aging Apple II, uh, which we did. And it was more about uh, packaging and marketing and rebuilding the dealer channel and things of that sort, because we were going to be the only source of cash flow for Apple for the next three years. And that turned out to be very successful and it gave us a lot of runway um, to be able to continue developing the Mac and get it out on, on the market. You know, um, I feel like just getting into this, this thing could go on for an hour. So I have to be careful with how I use this time because as I listen to you, I've got other questions that either we didn't talk about 48 hours ago or that, you know, we didn't talk about, um, you, you know, when I send you that follow up note. But so I want to make sure I kind of prioritize, prioritize these in my mind. So one thing I'm, I'm going to jump around here a little bit because I think this is really germane. We all know here we are in June of 2020. These are incredibly turbulent times. We have kind of these two dynamics that are converging and it's giving a lot of people angst from so many different angles. As somebody who maybe has not lived through something this massive, but there's been a lot of turbulent times in the last 30 years, socially, business-wise, maybe you could help um, the 200 people that are on the line you know, any lessons, any thoughts about what you did during these turbulent times or how you thought and maybe times that seem really low. So when we when you got out of them, um, things were actually better. And just some of those valuable lessons that you learned. And because we obviously have a lot of people under the age of 35 on the phone. And I think, you know, sometimes it's hard to see that there's light at the end of the tunnel, but there but there is. Well, what I can say with some confidence is that uh, there is an, a life after this pandemic. And whether it takes uh, a year or more to get a vaccine, uh, we, we will come, come out of it. We, the world, we, the United States. And the time can be well spent now to um, you know, think clearly, to not be timid, uh, to, to think in bold ideas, because uh, while there is clearly going to be a, a world after the pandemic, by world I mean a, an economy, a future, uh, huge opportunities, uh, particularly for new companies who are trying to you know, think in a different way, but uh, you have to be willing to take risks. And what I've seen, because I was there in, in 1987 when the stock market crashed, I was there in 9-11 when uh, the World Trade Center crashed. Um, and I was there in 2008 when the financial world uh, crashed, um, and, and we're all here together now, uh, that these are exactly the right times when you want to be clear-headed and be thinking what comes next, uh, looking out beyond the pandemic, because there will be an economy and there will be huge success stories that will emerge, some of which, um, you know, will be non-obvious before the pandemic, but very obvious afterwards. I mean, look at a company like Zoom. Zoom went public last year uh, with a market cap in single digits. It's market uh, single digit billions of dollars. Its market cap today is $61 billion. So uh, the pandemic uh, didn't change Zoom. What it did was it accelerated uh, the reason for adoption. And there's so many things that are going to be uh, different. You know, travel will be different. Um, business uh, travel will be different a lot, I think. But there are other things which are going to turn out to be uh, you know, accelerated in terms of their importance and the role in which they can have. I, I'm an early investor in a telehealth company. Um, I can tell you our business is booming. Why? Because <laughs> you know, doctors you know, aren't... Uh, wanting to take as many patients for appointments. People don't want to go there person to person in many cases. And it's so easy with uh, um, video and even a smartphone uh, to be able to have a doctor's appointment. So there's going to be huge opportunities for those who are willing to think clearly, to think out ahead, uh, but be bold, uh, don't be timid. 
Yeah, I think that's great advice. And you know, for the 199 people that are on the phone, 198 from Media Hub right now, 197. Um, I think one of the things that I've seen, and obviously, as you can imagine, I'm staying very close to our largest clients. Everything that I've heard is they've advanced in e-commerce in two months, what would have taken two years. So, you know, if you're trying to learn a new skill, if you're trying to get ahead, certainly understand the whole dynamic of e-commerce because that has dramatically changed. I want to shift to another topic because I think, you know, the other thing that I've kind of learned a little bit through this pandemic, and one of the things that I'm hoping comes out of this for the better, is the fact that I think our clients have a newfound respect for their agencies. I think, you know, given the 24 seven nature of yanking all their media out, replacing all their media, working via Zoom, getting to know us a little bit better. I think we forged greater relationships. You know, probably the most storied agency client relationship that I know was Lee Clow and Steve Jobs. You know, they almost in many ways felt like they had one Vulcan mine. So seeing the relationship that Lee Clow and Steve Jobs had, any thoughts or recommendations you can give for all these people on the phone, maybe on how to forge better client relationships? Well, it, it was a great relationship with Lee Clow. Uh, Lee Clow was the um, head of creative at, at Shia Day, um, and he worked closely with Steve Hayden. Steve Hayden was the one who actually wrote the, the commercial 1984 that we used for the, for the Super Bowl. But I think uh, the reason that the relationship was such a successful one uh, between Shia Day and, and, and Apple, and particularly Lee Clow and, and Steve Jobs, was that we were all sitting around in, in it was on um, the week of uh, October 19th, 1983, and we were still months away from the launch of the Macintosh, and uh, we were all looking at the cover of Business Week magazine, and IBM had been developing this product called the PC Junior, and they had just launched it. And Business Week has a cover story, and it says the winner is, you know, IBM. And we hadn't even introduced the Macintosh yet. So, you know, Steve was climbing the walls and, and frustrated. And we had Lee Clow there, and we had uh, Steve Hayden, the copywriter. He was the art director. And we were saying, so what, what do we do? And we said, well, uh, we're going to introduce it in January. Uh, and we said, well, we got to do something that will really get people's attention to show them that, 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 that Apple is alive and well, and we're going to change the world. And so that's when we came up with the strategy uh, of the 1984 uh, comparison to George Orwell's 1984. And we uh, decided to make a commercial for the Super Bowl. And Steve told Lee Clow, he said, look, he said, I want a, a commercial that nobody will be able to watch and not go away saying this is the most amazing commercial I've ever seen. So he said, just you know, swing for the fences. You know, go go for something that is outrageous as you possibly can. And that's what they eventually came back with, which is uh, I think many of you, if you haven't seen it, you probably heard of it, the Apple 1984 commercial. Wasn't there the story in the book, as I remember, you and I were talking about this a couple of days ago. And again, whenever the book was released, it was a while ago and I haven't read it since. So my memory doesn't remember it as well as after I just finished it. But didn't the board, after they saw the spot, tell Steve to pull it? And basically somebody told the agency to say that they couldn't get out of the Super Bowl, even though they could have gotten out of the Super Bowl. Do I have that memory right or something like that? Yeah, you have it very right. In, in fact, <laughs> I was supposed to be the adult in the room uh, when we were meeting with, with the board because um, I was uh, a little bit older than Steve and I was the CEO. And so the board all turned to me. We showed them the commercial uh, <laughs> and there was just dead silence. Yeah. And two of the board members put their head in their hand <laughs> and looked down at the table. And the other board members sort of leaned back <laughs> in the chairs and sort of were looking for the doors. And they turned to me and they said, you're not going to run that thing, are you? And <laughs> of course we're going to run it. It's, it's a really good commercial. And uh, they eventually 
said, well, we think it's a terrible commercial. Uh, how much have we paid for time on it? And we said, well, uh, we're, we, we paid a million dollars for, there was a 60 second commercial, a million dollars for a 60 second commercial. Yeah, 10, mil, 10 million today to buy 60 seconds yeah. as an FYI, yeah. but. <laughs> so, uh, we, we actually had, had <coughs> reserved for two minutes on the Super Bowl. Um, we sold one minute, but we kept the other minute, even though we could have sold it and didn't tell the board that, that uh, we actually could have sold the other minute. And so it, it ran. And while it cost us a million dollars, John, um, the estimate of the agency afterwards was that we got $45 million of free advertising because no one had ever seen a television commercial like this before. And it was kept running over and over by every network, by every local station, by people said, did you see this commercial on, at the Super Bowl? And of course the Super Bowl after that became famous for companies wanting to do uh, commercials yep. that would compete with the, the game itself. Yeah. Hey Ian, I see you popped up. Um, is that our time? Is that your not so subtle hint? <laughs> I gotta, I gotta apologize to the couple hundred people on the phone. They don't want to see me. They want to see you two guys. But uh, that, what, what we, we do need to cover off in a couple of pieces, if, uh, if that's okay with you two. Can I ask one, just one last question, and maybe, maybe uh, John can do it in 30 seconds or less. And it's something that I didn't send it beforehand. But I mean, there's a lot of people would pay a lot of money to ask John Scully this question, and we're going to get it for free. So, John, again. Um, uh, advertising is a very young person's business. We have a lot of younger people on the phone starting out their career and maybe five years into their career. What's the one piece of advice that you would give them to have a long and successful ad career? Well, I'll give them the same advice that I gave Steve Jobs when he said, you know, can you can you teach me how do you make great, great advertising? And I said, Steve, it's pretty simple. Uh, when you are a, a challenger brand. You've got to play by different ground rules. You, you can't play by the ground rules of the market leader because they'll always win. Uh, therefore, uh, said so the big insight I can give you is perception leads reality. So if you can pick a place that is beyond the boundaries of the established incumbent uh, that they can't respond to in any logical way, uh, that you can create the perception of the future, but you got to eventually be able to deliver the perception. So we did that at uh, Apple. At the same time we launched the, the uh, now famous 1984 Super Bowl commercial, uh, we also took over an entire issue uh, of ads with Newsweek magazine. I don't mean most of the ads, I mean every single ad in the magazine was an Apple Macintosh ad. And the perception yeah. that we wanted to create was uh, take a test drive with the Macintosh because no one had ever seen a, com a computer with a mouse with icons on a screen that could do uh, desktop publishing and things of this sort. So we used every single uh, ad page in that magazine <clears throat> to tell an incredible story about the perception that eventually became the reality. 